going live now. Are we live yes. or not? Yes, we are live. Okay. Hello. I warmly welcome you to our 60th webinar. So we have now 60 webinars today when the uh, sun eclipses and uh, the totally eclipse of the sun. And um, yeah, I welcome you to our webinar by the Academy of Space Renaissance International. And on this 8th of April, I'm really delighted that you have come to join us. My name is Sabina Heinz, and I'm the person responsible for our webinar series and one of the vice presidents of Space Renaissance International and also responsible for our art chapter. Our today's special guest is Professor Luigina Ferretti. Hello, Luigina, welcome. Hello, thank you. We are really glad that you are here, uh, that you have come to join us and uh, that you have prepared a talk uh, about astrophysics for dummies. And it was a really nice idea, actually, uh, from you and Adriano to initiate this because we, in our audience, we also have uh, many artists and space in interested people. Uh, engineers and uh, yeah, but uh, the, the, most of the people know about astrophysics, but uh, there are some uh, who are really happy uh, that you give us the opportunity uh, to, to learn. have a, a fundamental look uh, <laughs> on the basis, basics. I also would like to welcome Adriano Ottino. Uh, he is uh, also one of our vice presidents and former presidents of Space Renaissance as, uh, International and one of the founders. Uh, hello, Adriano, welcome. Hello, Sabine. Hello, Luigina. Welcome to you both. And uh, yeah, I'm very happy to listen to this uh, lecture by Luigina today. And uh, I will try to learn something because I have to confess I'm very, very ignorant about astronomy and astrophysics. Yes, it should be a shame for a guy like me that I'm interested in space. But uh, of course, one thing is to be interested and to be enthusiastic, and another thing is to be a scientist and to know everything what is to be known. Uh, therefore, I'm very happy to try to learn something today and very welcome, Regina, uh, to hold this lecture. Yeah, thank you, Adriano. And uh, Lugina, before I give you the floor, I would like to introduce you to our audience. Uh, Professor Luigina Ferretti graduated in physics at the University of Bologna and carried out research activity at the Instituto di Radio Astronomia uh, of the National Institute of Astrophysics, um, where she acted as a director from 2007 to 2015. The field of research is extragalactic radio astronomy, in particular the study of radio sources and clusters of galaxies and the study of large-scale cosmological magnetic fields. She is author of about 350 original papers in um, international scientific journals that have about 12,000 citations. She has organized several international conferences and participates in committees for research funding and the allocation of observing time at uh, international instruments. And Professor Ferretti has been president of the board for the construction for the Sardinia radio telescope near uh, Cagliari and of the management board of the Joint Institute for uh, YLBE in Europe, LBI in Europe. Uh, she's involved in science working groups uh, of the new generation radio telescopes, uh, square, radio telescope square kilometer array, and uh, which is being reali realized in South Africa and Australia. Lugina Ferretti is a scientific editor uh, of the international journal The Astronomy and uh, Astrophysics Re Review and as a member of the International Ast Astronomical Union. And she is also a member of the Space Renaissance Italia, Italia Board of Directors. Luigina, we are really glad to have you here and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for 
your nice introduction. Um, too good. Uh, I mean, uh, it's really uh, an honor to be to be here, and I hope to to teach you something. I, I cannot do all astrophysics in an hour. Uh, I picked up uh, some topics that I thought they were of interest, also uh, stimulated by questions of Adriano and uh, uh, talks uh, with him. And so, um, well, can I, I start? Have one more. Yes, yeah, you may check. I have one more question then. Ah, yeah, okay. You may share the, the end, screen then. first yeah. and then At the afterwards end. you can yeah, ask all your questions. Sure. So, you may share through the screen. So, it's chat and you can start your slides. So, you, you see the screen? Yes. yes. And you can put it on full screen. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, this is what I'm trying to do. I, I, uh, Adriano, can you uh, explain her in Italiano where it is? The, uh, one uh, on the right? this uh, icon. No, no, no. Uh, on the left hand side, uh, second icon, you can touch. No, no, no. M more up. Yes. Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, it's okay. No. Yeah, perfect. We made the perfect. rehearsal today. Never mind. Is okay. it okay? Yes, it's perfect. Great. Okay. Great. So the title was uh, Astrophysics for Dummies. I think I put a subtitle, which is a brush up on astrophysics for those uh, who know already something. So it's kind of a refreshment. Uh, I will uh, try to make it simple uh, without avoiding the formulas. Uh, so please stop me if, um, if uh, you don't understand, if there is anything unclear. Um, first, uh, before starting uh, with the topics, uh, uh, Echo. I, I wanted to, to honor this uh, solar eclipse of today. And this is a picture that was taken from the moon uh, already five or four years ago. And you see the surface of the moon, and you see the Earth, and you see the shadow cast from the moon on the Earth, which is exactly what is happening uh, right now. I think that this picture... Uh, is not of good quality, but, but um, uh, in my opinion, is very impressive. Um, there are not many um, such pictures with the shadow of the moon. So um, the outline of my talk is um, talking of uh, basics, um, issues in physics, gravitation, uh, motion in the Earth gravitational field, uh, escape velocity, uh, centripetal and centrifugal forces, and then Earth rotation and Earth magnetic field, something about the universe uh, from the Big Bang to the formation of object and structure, formation of the solar system, and um, uh, quickly on the evolution of stars. Uh, then I I put uh, a few slides on black holes and gravitation um, as uh, interpreted by Einstein, so gravitation and general relativity. Uh, if um, I, I, I'm not sure I will have time to, to do everything, but uh, uh, we'll see. We will try. We'll try. OK, uh, so gravitation. Uh, gravitation is the dominating force uh, in the universe. So uh, we have to start with, the, with this. Um, the force uh, um, is uh, the, the law of gravitation is, is uh, very simple and complete. And it says that every object in the universe with a certain mass uh, m, uh, big M, uh, attracts any other object of a different mass with a force that is proportional to both masses. And it is inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them. Uh, so this is the, the mathematical expression. F force equal m times uh, small m divided by the distance square. There is a constant, uh, proportionality constant, which is uh, g, uh, which is the gravitational constant. And it is a very small number. 
is um, 0, 0, 0, 0. You need 10 zeros before uh, arriving to the first digit. So th these tells us, it is uh, expressed here, tells us that this force is actually very small compared to other forces. It is the dominating force in the universe because uh, in the universe we are dealing with very big uh, masses. Uh, this law is due uh, to Newton, uh, and the legend is uh, that uh, um, Newton had the idea of this force after watching an apple falling uh, from uh, the tree. Uh, everybody knows this, but the story is uh, longer and more complicated than that. Uh, in particular, uh, ancients, um, ancient people have always been observing the sky and try to understand how celestial objects moved. Uh, the problem was why they move, what makes the planets go around, and so on. So 200 years uh, before Newton, uh, the debate was whether the planets were moving around the Earth or they were moving around the Sun. Uh, this was the debate, and crucial people to solve this debate were uh, Tycho Brahe. Uh, you see, uh, he, he lived uh, in the 16th century, who had an observatory, the Uraniborg Observatory in Denmark, in the island of Venn, um, near Copenhagen. And then another crucial person was uh, uh, Johannes Kepler, who was uh, his assistant of Tycho Brahe and Galileo Galilei. Um, Tycho Brahe, uh, to solve the debate about uh, the Earth at the center of the motion, or the Sun at the center of the motion of planets, uh, spent uh, 10 years observing uh, um, the celestial body, the planets and, uh, and other bodies at this observatory that um, you see depicted here. And he collected all this data, uh, but then uh, um, he was not able to reach uh, any conclusion because uh, he died in 1601 and Kepler took his data and analyzed them and uh, um, he, he was a mathematician so it took a long time and he arrived to the, um, to the three laws of the motion of uh, the planets. The first law is that the orbits of planets are elliptical, are not circles. Uh, it was believed that uh, the planets were moving on circles. Actually, he uh, found uh, the difference was only eight minutes, but he found that the orbits were ellipses with the sun at one of the focus, and you see it here. The Kepler second law, uh, is that um, planets um, have different velocity, do not uh, um, go around the sun uh, with the, the same velocity, but they go faster when they are near the sun and slower when uh, they are distant from the sun. Um, and the third law uh, was very important. It was the only one connected the different planets, one to each other. Uh, it says that uh, um, the time to, um, to do a complete orbit is related uh, to the um, axis, to the size of the orbit. So these were the Kepler's law, which were fundamental for, uh, uh, the, for, for, uh, for Newton to arrive to the... Uh, to the uh, realization of the gravitational uh, force. And then uh, I, I mentioned here Galileo Galilei, who first, uh, um, who first uh, uh, studied this uh, uh, principle of inertia, which, which uh, states that if something is moving completely undisturbed, it will go on forever at a uniform speed in a straight line. So it seems very simple. It is very simple, but uh, it is very, very important. And it is crucial for what I'm going to say in the in the next um, in the next time. 
so Newton um, modified the, the idea of, um, of Galileo, uh, saying uh, that, uh, stating that uh, since there is the principle of inertia, that uh, a body uh, which uh, has nothing touching it goes completely undisturbed, he uh, said that uh, the only way to um, change the speed of a body is uh, to act with a force. And uh, he, um, he arrived to the famous F equal uh, MA, where M is the mass, F is the force, of, of course, uh, and A is the acceleration. So Newton used the second and third Kepler's law to deduce the law of gravitation that you see um, that you see again uh, uh, below. And uh, he had uh, a very, very brilliant idea. So he said, uh, if, uh, um, if a body, according to the principle of inertia, goes forever in a straight line, uh, the force to make the planet to go around the sun is not the tangential but it is radial, so it's not uh, directed away from the sun, but it is directed toward the sun. It, it has to be a centripetal force because uh, a planet without uh, any force could coast uh, um, tangentially in any case. So uh, this was the, the, the idea of Newton to, uh, to uh, say, uh, say uh, that uh, the, the force, the gravitational force, is not uh, in the direction of the motion, but is toward the sun, is uh, um, radial. So uh, another comma is that uh, uh, as far as the planet, uh, the weaker is the force, uh, inversely as the square of distance, as we have seen in the, uh, in the formula. And uh, he, also, uh, he also had the idea that this relationship, uh, this equation about the gravitational force was not holding only for the sun and planets, but is more general. So is the force holding us on earth? It took a while for to him uh, to understand this, to understand that the force is the same. It is the force uh, um, that um, is uh, developed between Earth and Moon. It is between Jupiter and its Moon. And it is also the reason why the uh, Earth is, uh, is round. So um, you are trying to figure out how important was uh, this uh, contribution from, uh, from Newton about the, 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 the thoughts. So uh, a question that we um, can, um, can answer now and uh, uh, Newton could not answer because the universe known at the time of Newton was just the solar system is if the gravitation holds on a larger scale than the solar system. And the answer, of course, is uh, yes. Uh, we know perfectly well right now that the gravitation is valid on uh, much bigger distances than the solar system. Uh, and you see here the, um, uh, the some of the planetary systems that were discovered uh, by the mission, the Kepler mission. These are all um, extrasolar planets. We, they are... Uh, spinning around their, uh, their suns, their star, and they, of course, uh, their motion obeys the gravitational law. Double stars also obey the gravitational law. They uh, spin one around the other, uh, again, uh, according to this law. We have the star clusters, which are clusters of 10, uh, 100 to 1,000 stars. Uh, and these are big, uh, about 100,000 100, times the solar system. And you see, uh, these stars are kept together by the gravitation. Also, gravitation 
also in the interstellar clouds, which are 10 to um, 100 light years uh, in size. These are very famous images. Uh, these are um, clouds of uh, essentially uh, dust and elementary particles. And uh, uh, more uh, going uh, to bigger uh, systems, we have here uh, a spiral galaxy. And uh, here we have uh, an elliptical galaxy. Uh, these the galaxies contain hundred to thousand billion stars, and they are about uh, uh, one hundred fifty thousand light years in size. And again, they are kept together by the gravitation. On a bigger scale, the cluster of galaxies. The galaxies are usually not isolated, but they are um, kept together in the so-called clusters. Um, each cluster contains um, thousand big galaxies and thousand smaller galaxies, and they are 10 million light years in size, and gravitation exists over distances uh, as big uh, as uh, those uh, that you see here. So as I said, since the masses are big, um, gravitation is the dominating force uh, uh, in the universe. So what happens, going back to the Earth, uh, what happens if, if we shoot a bullet on Earth faster and faster? You see here the bullet, which is shot. Uh, if uh, we shot it faster and faster, it go more uh, distant. Uh, it goes uh, on, on larger distances. Uh, you see here uh, the Earth, uh, a bullet, which is a shot at a certain distance, stronger, it goes to a larger distance. If uh, it uh, is shot at a very high speed, it starts uh, an orbit around the Earth. And this is the, the picture of the orbit. So I'm not uh, going to the details uh, of, um, you, you see also here, the bullet slow, faster, faster, and uh, even um, faster. Uh, so when the, the bullet or uh, um, spacecraft leaves the Earth, it is because it has the so-called escape velocity, a velocity that is high enough to make it escape from the gravitational field of the Earth and go into an orbit, or uh, uh, we will see. So um, I will skip the, um, the formula of the escape velocity, but if anybody is interested, we can go back later. Uh, so uh, um, there, there are, I decided to, to show here uh, some of, um, of the orbits. Um, for instance, and in, here you see all these objects, uh, which are um, all these objects uh, which are orbiting around the Earth after uh, going uh, at the escape velocity. And uh, an important uh, orbit is uh, the so called geostationary, geostationary orbit uh, that uh, has uh, a duration, the, the spacecraft which is uh, um, orbiting on a geostationary orbit goes at the same speed as uh, the um, uh, surface of the Earth. So uh, a person on the Earth can see the spacecraft always at the same point, as if it is fixed. And geostationary orbits are, are very important because many satellites for meteo or for communication are just in a geostationary orbit. Uh, the size of this orbit is uh, 42,168 kilometers and can be derived from the Kepler's third law, you remember. Uh, the, the, the law that connects uh, the time of rotation and the size uh, of the orbit. So again, um, more interesting, uh, let's see uh, the moon. W what about the moon? The moon feels the attraction of the Earth. It doesn't fall on the Earth, uh, but actually it falls from a straight line. Because if, if there was not the force of the Earth, the moon would continue straight and disturbed according to the principle of inertia. 
uh, what the moon does is to fall, fall, fall around the earth. It doesn't go on the earth because it's too distant. But uh, actually, um, the force of the earth is keeping it uh, on a line which is not straight, but is uh, circular. Um, another example is the International Space St Station. Uh, the orbit of the International Space Station is uh, uh, a little more than 400 kilometers. Uh, so compared to, to the radius of, of, the, um, of the Earth, it is, it, is, uh, it is really not too much, uh, the height of the International Space Station. And uh, the gravitation, the gravitational force of the Earth on the International Space Station is just 90% of that on Earth. So uh, why do the astronauts on the International Space Station not feel the gravity? Uh, not because the gravitational force is too small, because actually, as I say, the orbit is, is really is a 400 kilometer, uh, so is uh, just a, a small percentage of, of the radius uh, of the Earth. This uh, picture is, is on scale. But um, the astronauts in the International Space Station uh, do not feel the gravity because they are in free fall as, as the spacecraft itself. So, like the moon, they are falling continuously. They don't, uh, they don't experience any force because they are in free fall. And so uh, this means that uh, they don't feel uh, the gravity. Uh, another issue about the motion uh, in, um, in the gravitational field of the Earth, of the sun, of the moon, are the, the motion of, uh, of spacecrafts and the motion of objects that are launched in the space. So when uh, a, a spacecraft is uh, uh, launched toward the moon, it doesn't go directly. It goes uh, some turns around the Earth and then some turns around the moon. This, uh, by the way, is the orbit, is the pathway followed by Artemis one. Uh, so it's very recent. And uh, this below is the pathway followed by uh, Soyuz uh, to go to the uh, International Space Station to bring people or to bring uh, supplies. So you see uh, the um, Soyuz or uh, the other uh, spacecraft that goes to the ISS. Uh, make many turns around the Earth before, be, before uh, attacking to, to the International Space Station. And uh, something that um, I wanted to mention is the, uh, the slingshot effect, which is again an effect due to the gravity. And uh, it is illustrated here, where you see uh, the first part of the trip of Voyager that was launched in 1977 from the Earth, which is here yellow. And uh, it is going out of the solar system. And before doing so, it goes uh, uh, through um, uh, Jupiter, it goes to Jupiter, to, uh, to Saturn, to Uranus. And what happens? Uh, you may have heard that these spacecrafts gain velocity when going uh, close to uh, the planets. Uh, this is because uh, the planets are moving. Uh, so uh, the um, slingshot effect called uh, gravity assist also uh, is, uh, uh, is an effect that is similar uh, to a tennis ball launched in front of a moving train. If you launch a ball in front of a train coming uh, against you, the ball gains velocity because the train is moving, right? If the train is uh, uh, not moving, the ball doesn't gain any energy. It is just reflected by the train. But if the train is moving toward us, the ball gets energy from the train. And this is the same effect uh, of this spacecraft of the Voyager that got energy 
from uh, uh, the Earth, from Jupiter, from Saturn, from Uranus, passing uh, close, uh, close to them. Uh, and this is the uh, well-known uh, uh, slingshot effect, uh, which is due, again, uh, to gravitation. So um, we have say we, we have found uh, mm, uh, Newton found uh, that uh, uh, the um, gravitational force is uh, um, toward the, the, the center. You see here the velocity is tangential, but the force is centripetal. And this is the example of the Earth with the spacecraft or the Moon or whatever. But uh, um, these uh, there are other kinds of centripetal forces. Um, and you see some example here. This is a spinning platform. Uh, this is a spinning ball. A boy who is spinning a ball with a wire is applying a force with uh, his uh, hand. And uh, also a car which is turning in a turn uh, of the road. Uh, this uh, car experiences a centripetal force. Otherwise, according to the uh, inertia principle, it would go forever in a straight line. So it needs a force to run. And this force is a centripetal force, which is against the center, while the, the velocity is tangential. So you see here the centripetal force is uh, toward the center. This is the velocity which is tangential. If we cut the, the, the wire, the centripetal force is no longer present and then the body goes in the straight line as uh, uh, we were saying uh, uh, before. So the centripetal force is a real force. And now we go to the centrifugal force. A centrifugal force is experienced by an object when it moves in a circular path. And is uh, if you are on the, on the car, or you are uh, in the carousel, or if you are uh, here uh, on the um, carousel again, is the sensation that uh, seems to push you away from the center of the circle. Actually, seen from outside, uh, you don't need to invoke the existence of the centrifugal force because uh, um, the motion, the motion of this car, the motion of this carousel uh, are all consistent with the, the Newton's laws. It's just a centripetal force which uh, makes the body deviates from a straight, uh, undisturbed uh, trajectory. So this is why the uh, centrifugal force is called an apparent force, because you uh, have to invoke it only if you are on the car, if you are in a system of reference which is in motion, which is in, um, in, a, in the circular motion, then uh, you feel uh, that you are pushed away from the center and you, uh, and you have to invoke uh, some force to justify this. Uh, actually, it is not a real force. It is only the uh, fact uh, that uh, the car tends, if there is no centripetal force, tends to go straight, as I showed before. Uh, if there was no centripetal force, the car could go straight. And this tendency of the car to go straight, which is uh, the uh, principle of inertia, is what causes the uh, the feel of the centrifugal force. So you, you see again here, the centripetal force pulls the mass inward to fall a curved path, while the mass appears to push outward due to its inertia. Actually, there is only one force applied, and is the centripetal, while the centrifugal is only apparent because it appears only in the system of reference, which is in motion with the, uh, with the stone. To make it clear, because this is an important concept, I have a few minutes uh, video that I think it is very clear. Objects naturally move in a straight line. 
at a constant speed. When an object does not experience any force, it has no reason to turn or change speed and will therefore conserve its motion. Looking towards the future, we can suppose that one day humans will make long journeys through space. For astronauts to survive for several months, we will certainly have to design spaceships that simulate gravity, since our bodies are used to it on Earth. One of the simplest solutions and the most promising is the idea of a centrifuge, a large spinning wheel in which the centrifugal force would repel astronauts outwards, giving them a feeling of gravity. Let us first try to understand the origin of the centrifugal force which holds the astronaut against the edge. To do this, we just need to observe the situation from the outside. When the wheel spins, it carries the astronaut with its movement. If he takes a ball in his hand, the ball describes a circle because it is held by the astronaut. But if the astronaut drops the ball, it is no longer subject to any force and it will therefore conserve its motion and move in a straight line until bouncing off the edge. From our point of view, the ball has simply followed a straight line. But for the astronaut, the ball seems to have fallen towards the edge. He feels like there is an imaginary force, the centrifugal force. It is important to understand that the centrifugal force is not really a physical force. When observed from the outside, we understand that the ball has not undergone anything. Once released, it is no longer in contact with the astronaut and it therefore moves straight ahead. But by observing the ball while spinning, the astronaut has the impression that there is an additional fictitious force, the centrifugal force, which he invents to explain the motion of the ball in his frame of reference. Okay, I hope that uh, this is clear. And so we go to the rotation of the Earth. Uh, rotation of uh, Earth is, uh, is rotating. And uh, due to what we said before, uh, the, the rotation, the points uh, at the equator are uh, moving at higher speed than the points at higher latitudes. And the pole is, uh, um, is not moving. Uh, the, just is just the point or moving very, very, very slowly. Uh, the, so you see the forces here. This is the force uh, toward the outside is larger at the equator and smaller, smaller going to the north. And this makes uh, the earth uh, squashed uh, into a slightly flattened sphere. So um, the effect actually is quite small, but since the Earth is not uh, completely solid, uh, there is uh, this uh, uh, flattening of, of the Earth. And you see here the amount of the flattening. Uh, it is not big, but uh, uh, it's about the difference between the equatorial diameter and the polar diameter is about 42 kilometers, uh, which is not much, but it is still double the height difference between the top of Mount Everest and uh, the deepest point of the ocean, the Mariana Trench. So th this, uh, um, actually, uh, this uh, difference uh, is not um, so, so small, I mean, is, is uh, completely discernible. Uh, another effect uh, of uh, uh, the, the, rotation, the, the rotation of the Earth uh, is uh, uh, was demonstrated by Michel Foucault with the Foucault pendulum. Uh, he demonstrated that the Earth was rotating uh, by hanging a, a long pendulum at the center of Pantheon, a Paris. Uh, and uh, since, uh, according to the law of physics, pendulum oscillates always on the same path, on the same plane, you would expect to see the pendulum always in the same plane. Instead, it does like this. It moves, it changes orientation. Why, why this? Because um, 
it is very simple to understand that the equator, the pendulum oscillates always in the same plane, but the Earth rotates beneath it. And so you see uh, this path, uh, which is like a star. Uh, you see, at the, at, the, um, at the pole, it is very, very intuitive to understand. The Earth is rotating while the pendulum keeps always the same plane of oscillation. Uh, in, in, um, oh dear. In other, in other, um, uh, okay, I don't know why, hmm? let's see. At, in, in other, uh, sorry, it, it doesn't work. Um, in other uh, latitudes, uh, the effect is not uh, as big as at the pole and is not uh, as intuitive to understand uh, as at the pole. But it, you have the same effect um, at several latitudes, except uh, at the equator. At the equator, the pendulum moves always in the same direction because the, the, the Earth keeps it uh, in its rotation. Uh, another effect of the, um, of the Earth rotation is the existence of uh, a magnetic field. Uh, so the Earth uh, um, behaves like uh, a big uh, compass uh, with the northern pole, uh, magnetic pole, and the southern magnetic pole. And um, uh, these uh, lines indicate the strength of the magnetic field, how it expands uh, toward the space. And it is very, very important because uh, it shields uh, the Earth, uh, this magnetic field shields the Earth from uh, the um, cosmic rays coming from the sun, from uh, the radiation, the dangerous radiation coming from the sun. Uh, so why is, uh, um, what is the origin of the Earth magnetic field? Uh, it is due to currents uh, which are in the uh, liquid outer core, which is made of iron, uh, the, 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 the external part of the core of the Earth, which is here uh, orange, is um, dominated by, uh, by iron. And uh, so uh, rotation of this core creates a current, and this current creates uh, the, the magnetic field. The, the nucleus, this nucleus of, um, of the Earth, as well as other layers, uh, rotate, uh, change the rotation because of interaction with other layers, because of uh, seismic activity, volcanic activity, and also because of the interaction with the planets, because of gravitational forces which uh, uh, can arrive uh, to the center. And so we have uh, changes in the magnetic field. Uh, in particular, uh, I can show you that uh, the magnetic North Pole uh, is uh, shown here. Uh, is moving toward Russia of about uh, 50 kilometers per year. You see it was uh, here in Canada and now is uh, uh, close to the geographic pole. Uh, this is 2017 and now is moving uh, more. And also the South Pole is uh, um, moving slower, about 10 kilometers per year but uh, has moved uh, toward, um, through Antarctica and is now uh, in the, located in the ocean in the direction of, of Australia. And so these, um, these changes are effect of the uh, changes in the rotation of the nuclear core of the Earth. Uh, an extreme effect is um, a reversal of the two poles. Uh, that is, uh, the uh, north magnetic pole becomes the, the southern magnetic pole, and the south magnetic pole becomes the northern pole, uh, which means that this, uh, uh, this compass reverses, uh, reverses the, the, the direction. Uh, so reversals of, uh, the, of the magnetic poles of the Earth have happened several times in the past, um, but always uh, uh, irregularly. So they are not uh, um, irregular times. Uh, they, there have been about 200 reversals in 80 million years. 
uh, and that there were 20 reversals in the last five million years. The last reversal occurred seven, eight hundred thousand years ago. And uh, um, it is still debated how long it took uh, the reversal to take place. Uh, it seems that it took between 2,000 years and 12,000 years. So the uh, reversal of the polarization of the Earth magnetic field is a, really a very slow process. We do not expect a flip uh, and see what happens. It is very, very slow. So maybe this motion that I showed uh, are just uh, the beginning of a slow reversal that will take place in 10,000 years or so. Um, now, uh, I, I want to show you some, uh, to give you some information about the origin of the universe. Um, what you see here is the Big Bang. Big Bang is uh, marks the birth of time and the expansion of space, which happened uh, 3.8 billion years ago. This is the beginning of space and time, the beginning of the universe. Mm -hmm. Universe um, cannot be this, the physics cannot uh, describe what happened in the first uh, uh, seconds of the Big Bang. Uh, we know that uh, in these uh, few seconds, uh, there was a big, big expansion at a velocity that we are unable uh, to describe. And then uh, gravity started to slow down the expansion, uh, the um, temperature decreased and the uh, uh, elementary particle start to be created. And um, we have uh, um, the formation of a structure. Uh, maybe people don't know that this Big Bang name uh, was given by Fred Hoyle uh, whom uh, everybody knows. He was an astrophysicist, but, but after being a, a writer of uh, science fiction, uh, he was also an astrophysicist. And he, he was against uh, the Big Bang Theory. Uh, so uh, when he was interviewed by the BBC to explain his idea of the universe, he uh, mentioned the Big Bang, used the term Big Bang to, uh, with the derision to, the, to describe a theory that he did not accept. And that it is very, very curious that this name remained uh, to, to, uh, to characterize the model of universe that now is uh, uh, commonly accepted by, by everybody, every scientist. So the, um, after the big explosion, uh, the structure started to, uh, to, uh, to form uh, because uh, all the particles uh, were attracted. Uh, we know that uh, uh, matter was uh, not uh, uniform. It was not uh, uniform. There were small, uh, small pieces of disomogeneities. Dis um, if the particles were motionless, uh, they could, all the particles would simply uh, fall one into the other and uh, go to denser region, to denser region, always uh, regions more and more dense. But uh, we know that they were, they had a lot of motion, all the particles, as you see in, in this uh, cartoon. And so they kept this motion and um, gravity turned this motion into orbital motions. That's why every object in the universe moves, uh, rotates, uh, because uh, um, the particles that were created at the Big Bang had a linear motion, and gravity turned this linear motion into orbital, into orbital motion. So uh, this is the, the explanation. Uh, of uh, uh, the formation of uh, stars, uh, galaxies, and various objects that had uh, some, uh, so in physics we call angular momentum, so the capacity of rotate. This is uh, a 
uh, scheme, a cartoon of the Big Bang. You see the big explosion here, um, quick uh, expansion, and then uh, the, mat the, the matter starts to, um, to, to aggregate and the uh, object more and more uh, big uh, uh, are formed. Uh, the process is, uh, is very slow. Uh, we are now here, about here, and the universe is now expanding again. So uh, it has accelerated its expansion, is not going uh, at the same velocity, but it is, uh, but it is accelerating. Um, and when, you, when we, are, we are here and we observe the object far away, toward the Big Bang, we see them when they were younger because we see them through the light that they emit. Light has a velocity of 300,000 kilometers per second, but it's not uh, infinity. So it takes time for the light to uh, cross the universe. So when we observe a distant object, we see them when they were younger. And uh, uh, this is uh, another issue that maybe one uh, doesn't think about. Um, in the process of the formation of the universe, uh, um, an, an important uh, dominant uh, ingredient is the dark matter. Is the dark matter, uh, and is the dark energy. Dark energy is uh, the energy that is now producing an acceleration of the universe while the dark matter is a matter that we don't know and um, is about 80% of all the matter in the universe. So the ordinary matter is 20% of all the matter and is only 5% of all the uh, available energy. Uh, just um, to say that the Milky Way formed 10 billion years ago and we are here. So we are in an arm, we are not at the center. And uh, here is a picture of, of the solar system, uh, or not the solar system, of the sun and of the planets uh, um, depicted in, into scale. Uh, so you see uh, how small we are. The solar system formed uh, uh, much later than the galaxy, uh, the Milky Way, uh, that we belong to, uh, it formed 4.6 uh, billion years ago. Um, another video about the formation of the solar system. Space place. This is very, Space very simple. From NASA. How did our solar system come to be? The solar system is a pretty busy place. It's got all kinds of planets, moons, asteroids, and comets zipping around our sun. But how did this busy stellar neighborhood come to be? Our story starts about 4.6 billion years ago with a wispy cloud of stellar dust. This cloud was part of a bigger cloud called a nebula. At some point, the cloud collapsed, possibly because the shockwave of a nearby exploding star caused it to compress. When it collapsed, it fell in on itself creating a disk of material surrounding it. Finally, the pressure caused by the material was so great that hydrogen atoms began to fuse into helium, releasing a tremendous amount of energy. Our sun was born. Even though the sun gobbled up more than 99% of all the stuff in this disk, there was still some material left over. Bits of this material clumped together because of gravity. Big objects collided with bigger objects, forming still bigger objects. Finally, some of these objects became big enough to be spheres. These spheres became planets, dwarf planets. Rocky planets like Earth form near the sun because icy and gaseous material couldn't survive close to all that heat. Gas and icy stuff collected further away, creating the gas and ice giants. And like that, the solar system as we know it today was formed. There are still leftover remains of the early days though. Asteroids in the asteroid belt are the bits and pieces of the early solar system that could never quite form a planet. Way off in the outer reaches of the solar system, 
are comets. These icy bits haven't changed much at all since the solar system's formation. In fact, it is the study of asteroids and comets that allows scientists to piece together this whole long story. Brought to you by NASA's Space Place. Okay, um, I, I would like to say that uh, uh, we have seen uh, when I showed uh, uh, how the gravitation works uh, on um, on larger scales. Uh, I showed the sum of the nebula uh, that uh, that uh, are a cradle of uh, of future planets, and uh, also uh, I, I'd like to point out that we are observing now these disks. Uh, so-called protoplanetary disk. Let's echo this. It is possible to observe disks around the stars, which are planetary systems in formation. Uh, all, all several things in this. Um, this is a, a protoplanetary disks, and they are commonly observed in, um, in, the, in the universe. So this uh, is a picture of the planets I like because uh, they are uh, rotating and the rotations are on scale. So you see those who who rotates very quickly. Uh, you know, Jupiter is very, very big and rotates very, very quickly. And uh, Uranus uh, um, is uh, lying uh, on the orbit. Uh, so it rotates uh, around uh, the direction of, of the motion. And uh, these uh, Mercury and Venus are too slow. So uh, they, they are not shown rotating, you see is uh, 243 days uh, while uh, Earth is 23 hours. Okay, um, so we have seen in the movie how the planets form. Uh, and uh, again, uh, I wish to stress that the planets are round due to the effect of gravity, which uh, pulls uh, equally from all sides, creating uh, a three-dimensional uh, sphere, not a circle. Uh, on the other hand, there are in the solar system uh, asteroids and smaller bodies that come in a range of irregular shapes because their gravity is too weak to pull them into a sphere. So the sphere is the shape of the big objects due to gravity, and they are spherical due to the gravitation. But the smaller uh, bodies um, have, uh, have uh, have uh, irregular shapes uh, because the gravity was not uh, is not strong enough to um, to put them uh, to give them a spherical a spherical shapes. So this is uh, the Vesta asteroid, which has a mean diameter of uh, 500 kilometer, um, and is irregular. While Ceres, which is the biggest asteroid, has a diameter of uh, about thousand kilometer and it is round, why Vesta is not round. And again, comets uh, are made of rock um, and they are quite small. The cores of the of the comets are quite small. Uh, this is the nucleus of a temple one, which is uh, eight uh, times five kilometer. So too small to, to make a, a sphere. And the Halley comet, um, I didn't find a, a picture of the of a photograph of the nucleus. Uh, the nucleus has a potato shape, uh, 15 kilometers times eight times eight. So I put uh, a picture of, of Giotto. And uh, going to the sun, what is the fate of the sun? Uh, the sun has been shining for 4.6 billion years. And uh, today is here. This is the birth of the sun, as you have seen in the in the in the, in the video. Um, and now today we are uh, almost uh, here, four point six billion here. Uh, the fate of the sun is uh, to expand uh, 
uh, is to um, continue the um, the activity uh, in the center, the nuclear reactions in the center, and then at a certain point, but um, four billion is from now, so we are not worried about this. It will expand as far as Venus, thus rendering the Earth uh, inhabitable. So it will expand and then it will reach the end of its life as a dim uh, white uh, white dwarf. So um, a few words, uh, maybe it is useful to say a few words about uh, um, evolution of a general star, not just the sun. Uh, the star we know emits uh, light and energy and um, this uh, um, light and energy originate from uh, nuclear reaction at the center. At the center, there is the hydrogen that uh, fuse uh, together uh, with the reaction, which is the nuclear fusion. Two atoms of hydrogen fuse together to give an atom of helium. And uh, this uh, reaction at the center provides uh, enough pressure to counterbalance the gravity. So the sun is stable. It doesn't collapse before of gravity. It doesn't expand because of the pressure of the nuclear reaction. But when the hydrogen will finish, there will be other nuclear reaction involving heavier elements till the iron. Um, once till until the iron, after the iron uh, nuclear reaction, um, the nuclear fusion uh, doesn't uh, produce energy anymore, so the reaction stops. And at this point, the nuclear fuse is exhausted, gravity prevails, and the star core starts uh, to collapse. The star core starts to collapse while the outer layers will be expelled, and this is uh, uh, why the sun will expand uh, up to at least uh, the orbit of uh, Venus. The contraction is uh, stronger, is uh, as stronger as the star is more massive. Um, we will have uh, stars uh, of um, as small as the sun, which will become, uh, as I said before, white dwarf, uh, which are uh, cold stars, which are not, uh, not emitting uh, any, any radiation. Stars with the four, eight times the mass of the sun will become neutron star, and uh, they uh, will explode uh, as a supernovae. And stars with the more than eight to 10 masses that of the sun uh, will collapse uh, with the extreme force of gravity and will eventually uh, become uh, the famous black holes. So, uh, Adriano, is, is it, um, can I have five more minutes to, to say something about the black holes? Yes, yes, of course. Yeah, the actually. The director is uh, fantastic and we want, we don't want to cut you. Please go ahead. Okay. <laughs> yes, finish it simply. I mean, this is okay. This... So the black hole uh, is uh, uh, produced at the end of a star much more massive than the sun. So it is important to stress this. The sun will never become a white, um, a black hole. He will become a white, a white dwarf. dwarf. But uh, stars much bigger than the sun uh, will uh, have uh, uh, such a big gravitation that will collapse and uh, become uh, black holes. Black holes are the extreme uh, are the extreme status of matter is the more condensed matter possible. It's uh, they are uh, so um, so so condensed. Uh, uh, that uh, they exert such an extreme gravity force that nothing can escape from, from, um, from the black hole, not even the light. Indeed, we do not see the black holes. 
because even the light cannot escape. Uh, not only, but uh, the, the space around the black hole is distorted. Is distorted because it acts like a gravitational lens. So gravity again is so strong, then it acts, um, it is acting like, like a lens. So this is the Earth as it would be seen through the black hole, so completely, completely distorted. And this is another nice uh, video showing a view of Baltimore, the town of Baltimore, uh, how it would be distorted uh, if uh, a black hole could pass uh, um, between us and, and the town. So the black hole comes from the left. And you do not see it, it's just a point. And it distorts everything. So it is really like a, a very, very strong lens. Uh, everything is distorted. Um, what you see is distorted. The, the light um, follows this strange path. And then finally, we can arrive to the view of uh, Einstein uh, about, uh, about, uh, uh, about the gravitation, um, the, 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 the classical uh, dynamics uh, uh, developed by, by Newton, was revised by the theory of relativity of uh, Einstein, uh, who said that uh, uh, gravity can be described as a distortion of space-time due to masses, exactly how we have seen uh, in the video before of this uh, black hole, which is distorting the view of, uh, of a town. Actually, the, 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 the gravity, the masses, distort the universe. And the universe changes its geometry. So we are talking of a curvature of space-time. This was the view of, uh, um, of the uh, modern uh, um, the modern vision of gravity. So the universe is uh, um, similar to a soft carpet can be can be considered i mean uh, visualized as uh, um, carpet uh, soft carpet uh, i think that in english uh, you can say a trampoline uh, with uh, elastic um, something which is elastic and uh, if this is the universe, which is elastic, which is a trampoline, uh, the Earth, with its mass, creates a, a distortion. And this is the distortion that makes the moon rotating around it. The sun creates a um, distortion, uh, which is a, a bit larger because the sun is bigger than, uh, than the Earth. And you see the distortion uh, of this trampoline and all the objects rotating because of this uh, geometry. And this is uh, uh, this image is in Italian, but uh, the concept is the same. A massive object creates a distortion of the space-time. So the geometry of the universe is changed. And uh, you can see that. Uh, also, the light, which is the yellow line here, changes its uh, direction, is distorted by the curvature of the space-time. So uh, Einstein equations are, are very, very complex. Um, and they are also presented in a compact form uh, that uh, is quite difficult to understand. But, uh, we can say that uh, um, Einstein equations tell us that the geometry, the geometry of the universe 
depends on the masses, which means that depends on gravitation. And this is a, a quite a new concept with respect to the classic physics uh, and to the Newton theory of gravitation. But of course, the law of, of Newton uh, still apply. Uh, these are, um, I mean, this view is, uh, um, uh, is approaching the problem in a more complete way involving the space and, and the time. But uh, in, in conclusion, masses follow the deformation of the, of the space-time produce, produce by the big masses. Uh, the matter tells uh, to the space-time how to deform. And the space-time tells the matter how to move. And this is the view of Einstein of gravity, which is quite complex, but uh, it is just to give an idea that, uh, mm, I mean, there are more modern concepts uh, with respect to, to the classical um, dynamics uh, presented by, by Newton. So I think that uh, I come to the conclusion. I put uh, in uh, my conclusions the questions that uh, were uh, presented to me at the time uh, of um, uh, when you decided uh, to, to do this uh, webinar. So the question is why do, the first question was why do all celestial bodies spin and why do they revolve around something else? Moons around planet, planet around sun, blah, blah. And the, the answer is, uh, is now very clear and simple, I think, I hope that uh, it was clear. It is due to gravitation on objects in motion. Uh, Big Bang has given motion to the objects and the gravitation has done uh, the rest. What is the centripetal force? Does it coincide with gravitational attraction? Actually, it is, uh, it is the opposite. Uh, gravitational attraction is a centripetal force, but uh, there are other kind, uh, other examples of centripetal forces like uh, the carousel, uh, the um, stone, uh, the car, uh, which is going in a circle and so on. So centripetal force is something that is described by uh, the dynamics of Newton. Uh, other question, gravitational attraction is proportional to the mass of the celestial body. Why is centrifugal force not manifested on celestial bodies that have gravitational attraction? Uh, actually, um, I hope that uh, also this was clear. It depends on the reference system. Um, centrifugal force is an apparent force. Actually, what is manifested is uh, um, the tendency of the bodies to yeah. go in a straight line if there was no force. If there is force, they do not go straight and you feel uh, the centrifugal uh, effect. Does anything rotating in space generate a centripetal force? Um, so again, uh, we are um, saying uh, uh, very similar things. So we say that uh, uh, as an answer, the centripetal force makes a body to follow a curved path. Um, the, um, not, not the opposite. Uh, so it's not the rotating uh, body that generates a centripetal force, but it's the centripetal force that makes a body to follow a curved path. And centrifugal force is caused just by the inertia. When you feel uh, you against uh, the um, chair of the car on a turn, uh, this is because your body tends to go straight. But the, instead, the, centrif the centripetal force makes you change the direction. Uh, what uh, is it a matter of size and mass? Yes, of course, gravitational attraction depends on mass. Is centrifugal or centripetal force real or are they simply an effect of gravity? Uh, so centripetal force is real. Centrifugal force is uh, uh, apparent, is a pseudo science, pseudo force. Okay, I hope Thank that, uh, I hope that uh, something <laughs> will remain. I hope that it was not too difficult. No, thank you so much. Uh, it was a really, really interesting lecture and well explained. And I'm really glad that uh, 
Uh, could you please uh, stop sharing the screen so we, we three can be on the... Yeah. And yes, thank you so much. And uh, I really understood the first time many things. <clears throat> so it was a really great lecture. Um, yeah, it was a good idea from you, Adriano, to initiate uh, this lecture. And I think we should repeat it. Um, no, I, I'm, I'm, I mean, they are not easy concepts. Uh. Uh, and uh, so, uh, if there is something not clear, uh, it is, uh, I mean, uh, it is I reasonable, it. Uh, especially the centrifugal force. Uh, I talked to a student who is studying engineering but, and he has no Yes, experience. but it was interesting and I, I, I could understand you made it really clear. So, uh, it was really, really good. Uh, I have here it's a question always, it from... It is always better, let me say, it is always better not to feel shame about our ignorance because uh, making questions is key for anything that we want to do. We have to make questions. We have to make questions. And... Uh, yeah, I, is what Umberto Eco said. I have to, yes, I have to confess that today I learned a couple of very important things that I never... I was never able to 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 get before uh, because today it was explained in a in a clear way and it's uh, easy to excellent understand. excellent I, I have to agree with Adriano. I'm glad I'm glad yes yes I have here a question from I, I would like to uh, greet our audience we have people watching from Norway from, from Spain from Germany um yeah from different countries from uh, france and um i have a question here from uh alai I, 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 uh, kotari and he's asking what are the chances uh, that the last pool reversal was responsible for the holocene period now which also began about 9500 years ago uh, 900, when was 9,000, uh, 9,500 years ago. Can you say again what happened? Yes. Also, what are the chances that the last pole reversal was responsible for the, for the Holocene period uh, now, um, which also began about 9,500 years ago? Also, the Holocene period began 9,500. So you know, and uh, what is, uh, the, are the chances that the last poll reversal was responsible for this? Uh, actually, the, the last reversal was uh, um, seven, uh, 780,000 years ago. Yes. So, so much, no... much, much, much more distant. Uh, certainly, there are motions. There are motions. Um, there are changes in the rotation of the core of the earth. So there are changes in the direction of the magnetic field. And these uh, have can have several effects, can have some effects, but the, the, the reversal, um, the reversal, uh, I think uh, um, it is too long ago. And also keep in mind, mm -hmm. we have to keep in mind that the reversal is very, very slow. It, yes. is, uh, it takes about 10,000 years hmm. to, 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 to develop. Uh, and uh, it is, I mean, there is a, a big uncertainty. It's an uncertainty in, uh, between 2,000 years and 12,000 years, but uh, not less than 2,000 years and probably around 10,000. They, they, they make these uh, measurements by measuring the magnetism of rocks uh, on the on the um, uh, bottom of the oceans uh, these rocks uh, keep uh, magnetized and they find that the magnetization uh, keep the tracks of these uh, these reversals it's very interesting also these who take a complete um, um, complete uh, seminar uh, there's an, uh, thank you. Here's another question. Uh, will beta goitz uh, when it goes Sn, to form into a mass singularity, uh, in a, form into a mass singularity as a black hole? You say when? When 
also will Betel Goetze when it goes I, as I, no I don't think that Betel Goetze will go into a black hole uh, uh -huh. because it is a main sequence star it will probably uh, well I'm I'm not sure, but um, I think it will uh, explode like a supernova and uh, uh, then leave uh, a neutron star, neutron star at the center. Uh, he means it supernova. Will not, it will not become a black hole. Uh -huh. This was a question with Betai Goetze when it goes uh, supernova to form yeah. into a mass singularity. Yeah, I didn't know what SN means. So, um, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. It, it okay. will become uh, a supernova. When we don't know, when we don't know, we know that uh, it is uh, um, it is very bright. It has uh, shown uh, variations uh, in the in the brightness, uh, and so uh, we we expect uh, that uh, it will happen not uh, in billion years. Uh, not in a million years, but uh, it is really difficult to know. Uh, it is a uh, pr practice, it is impossible. Uh, it, it is probably, it is the next one and uh, we will see it. It it will be very spectacular. Uh, I, mm. I remember you that uh, uh, there was a supernova explosion in um, 1054 year, 1054. Uh, which is the Crab Nebula, that was uh, uh, that was uh, seen by the Chinese, uh, uh, and uh, during also during the day, also when the sun was shining, and they they saw this uh, this uh, supernova for uh, several days, and it was shining. It was so bright that it was shining also during the day because Crab Nebula is in our um, in our galaxy, so it's not too distant uh, in, in the terms of uh, cosmic distances. And also Betelgeuse is not too distant. So we, if it happens, uh, we will see, but nobody knows. Okay, and here's another question. Will humanity ever be able to actually know what uh, was before the Big Bang? Uh, no, <laughs> uh, that's a, a very difficult question, but uh, it is uh, what we would like to know. Everyone wants to know. Actually, think... uh, just, uh, just uh, as a first uh, thing, I'd like to say that physics is not able to describe uh, even the first uh, um, uh, seconds uh, of the Big Bang. So uh, it is, uh, of course, impossible to know what was before. Uh, a few years ago, when I was um, uh, at the beginning of my astrophysical career, there was uh, a model of the universe that I liked a lot, which was the cycling the universe. So universe that expands and then it compresses again and then it expands and then it compresses. So uh, many cycles of this universe that expand and compresses. So you understand what before the Big Bang. Before the Big Bang, there was another universe that uh, re uh, recompressed and then it exploded again. Now, uh, with, the, with the knowledge that we have of the dark matter, dark energy, ordinary matter, and whatever, and value many models, uh, um, sophisticated particles, and so on, uh, we, we think that uh, uh, all what we know is consistent with the universe uh, going, expanding forever expanding forever, 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 for other uh, 20 billion years, and so becoming uh, the so-called big freeze, all frozen, and no interaction between things because they, they are too distant to interact, no light, uh, of everything will turn off. Yeah. So this is what, this is the current theory. Uh, oh. So, uh, to know what was before the Big Bang is really impossible.
Uh, and who knows this? Uh, or the person who will find it out will get the Nobel Prize. I'm quite quite sure of this. <laughs> uh, Adriano, do you have yeah, uh, one question. question? One more question? Yeah, mm -hmm. well, a small question. I hope the answer will be quick as well. Uh, you have shown in one of your slides the uh, orbit of the ISS. Okay, and I heard uh, some time ago that ISS is not useful as a possible harbor to start uh, missions, space mission from, from that, because of the orbit. So why? Why it's too low? Why it is too, too low? I, I think they uh, were it, is refer close, they were... it is too close to the Earth. So it is not, it is not of help. It's I not see. of help starting from uh, from the ISS because it's so close to the Earth. So uh, that is you, the you better you better um, instead of sending uh, a, a spacecraft to the ISS and then uh, having it to start a mission from there, you just send from yeah. there. Uh, yeah. If you want, I can go back to 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 the to the. Um, I think they also of... refer to the particular inclination of the orbit. That is, I, I don't remember exactly, but I, I... I think it was slice 11, something like this. Hmm. Uh, so let's see if I am able to... No, aspetta, un momento, allora. Can you see the screen now? No. No. Uh, yes, now yes. Yes. Yes, you see the screen, but I don't. Ah, yes, I, I do. Allora, let's go back. I think it was 11. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No. Yeah, this is the yeah. Sayos journey to the International Space Station. So you see, it's very, it's very complicated, the sending but things. But there was, there, there was the, the uh, there was Earth, big Earth, and the orbit. The, this. Oh, okay, this one. Mm. Yes. It was 10, okay. Yeah, it, it's, uh, it's uh, too, it's too close, uh, I think. Uh, you see, when you go to the moon, you, you have to, to run, uh, around the earth and then go to the moon starting from uh, from this small uh, this orbit is too too low uh, is okay. is not useful for this this is my so it's not a real advantage it's not a real advantage because you are traveling at 27 km per hour but that's not enough As, indeed indeed you have to to generate more more velocity to to escape yeah Okay. Okay. And so you better you better go directly in at your at your uh, at your um, target. Okay. Okay. Thank you. You know. Okay. Well, uh, well, uh, may I just? As... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so why Soyuz take a few hours to reach ISS while the Dragon takes two days? Uh, well, I don't know the di difference between Soyuz and Dragon. Um, of course, the, the the space station is just 400 kilometers. So at the speed, at the escape velocity, uh, the the spacecraft could go straight in a few minutes. Uh, so the spacecraft can reach the height uh, very shortly. Then it takes a uh, hours because it has to to go to the right position the the orbit of uh, the space station i just showed one orbit but you know it changes continuously it changes continuously the orbit of the space station okay oh by the way uh, it is I'm not the one it, it is not the same i, ju I just showed uh, one um, because i wanted to to make it clear that it is quite low and uh, uh, gravitation is, uh, uh, is uh, you don't feel gravitation, not because the gravitational force uh, is too low, but because you are in free fall. Yeah. So this was my, my aim. Uh, but the orbits are very, very different. It goes uh, like this. 
and then it goes also like this. Otherwise, yeah. you'll see space station every evening. However, we yes. have a we have an answer by Alberto Cavallo in the chat. It says that uh, it 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 has this inclination. Uh, it is not circling around the equator, so you exactly. have a component of velocity if you want to go farther. This inclination was chosen to make it reachable from Baikonur. But but uh, 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 yeah, also the, the the particular inclination is also not useful to uh, for uh, uh, for starting from there and go farther. Not Aspect. only the, the, oh, yes, yes. Or the, the chat. Um, uh, I, I have in mind. Um, that the orbit of uh, it goes around. Uh, now I, I can see. Uh, the orbit is not uh, just the same. It's not always the same. It changes. It changes continuously. And the, it, uh, except for the poles, it goes almost uh, on uh, every part uh, of, of the world. If I can find an image, uh, so. Okay, and Thurston Frank is saying that above the time to reach the ISS, Roscosmos is also using very tight launch windows, which enable a short transit time. Okay, okay, so. Uh, SpaceX is uh, using maybe longer uh, launch windows that uh, give some more constraints about uh, the the the, the, uh, the transit time. Oh, can you see the screen? Yes. These yes. Are, uh, the orbit of the ISS is not just uh, one that I showed, okay. but it uh, it changes continuously. You see. Yes. But it's not never equatorial, however. So it's Albert never equatorial and yes. it doesn't go on the pole. Yes, Alberto. But it is goes that, like this. Alberto is saying that an equatorial orbit is uh, important when you have to to escape uh, from uh, from orbit. Okay, okay. And that was saying so, it is yeah, not they, circling yeah, around the equator. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, Alberto is saying it's not circling around the equator like she is telling us, Adriano. No, I'm not. Uh, I'm not saying. I'm showing the image. Uh, yes, 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 yes. But he's saying see, the same not, like you. Uh, hmm. What I try yeah. to say is that well, there are okay. different parts. Yeah, 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 yeah. Not he, just he, the one. Uh, it's not just can... one uh, orbit that I showed uh, in the presentation. I will change time. it because it's misleading. Yes, yeah. yes, it's, it's, it's the same like you. Hmm. Okay. Um, I thank you so much um, for, for this really interesting evening. And I think we would like to invite you again. Uh, yes. I, I think we have more questions uh, we can talk okay. about. And uh, um, okay. as I told you in forehand, uh, so maybe we can uh, use this. Um, thank you very much uh, for this really uh, clear and uh understandable lecture and uh, yeah I, I took a, a lot from this um okay no i'm i'm glad i i thank i thank you for the invitation we, we have to thank and you and for, uh, and i'm really happy for your interest in uh, yes uh, uh we are really happy and um thank you again and I would like to mention that um, the, we see each other on the 6th of May. Uh, Alessandro Botol Botoloni uh, will talk about the effects of uh, ionizing radiations in space, uh, safeguarding uh, human life and health. So um, thank you so much for joining us. And um, I would like to remind you that we are a non-profit organization. So please uh, yeah, join us, uh, join SRI. Um, we are doing this here all voluntarily. All the our speakers are doing that um, in a, on a voluntary basis. So thank you so much. Uh, we cannot 
appreciate enough what we are doing for us. And uh, Adriano, thank you for your help, for installing everything. And I wish you all a nice evening and a happy 1st of May. Thank you. Thank you very and much. And see us on the 6th of May. And I would say, Bye. I would say, the real guilty is not ignorance, is lack of curiosity. So yes. we have to be curious and try to learn as much as we can and, and we never stop learning and that's keeping our brain alive. Okay? So thank okay. you very much, Luigina. Thank you, everyone. And Adasta. 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 Thank Thanks, you. Sir. Thanks, Bye. everyone. Bye.